His Excellency, Mr. Petro Poroshenko, Her Excellency, Mrs. Marina Poroshenko, Cher Conseiller Fédéral Didier Burkhalter, President of the Government Council of the Canton of Zurich, Ms. Regina Epley, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Zurich. As president of this institution, I am very proud to see it being host to a lecture given by the president of Ukraine. Ukraine is a country that not many of us have seen with their own eyes. Perhaps this room is an exception. But it's a country that in the last years has been increasingly in our minds and we have become familiar with it due to the events that we have heard about in the news. It is a country whose current situation is moving us deeply. I am also very happy to welcome our foreign minister, Didier Burkhalter, who held the chairmanship of the OSCE in 2014 and was closely involved in the process of negotiating peace in Eastern Ukraine. We are here today at the invitation of the Europe Institute at the University of Zurich. The Europe Institute is one of the leading centers of expertise for European law in Switzerland. As part of its program, the European Institute regularly organizes public lectures, including these special Churchill lectures. The Churchill lectures commemorate the visionary speech on the future of Europe that Sir Winston Churchill delivered in our main lecture hall in our aula on September 19, 1946. His flaming appeal for a reunited Europe a Europe of peace, a Europe of stability, a Europe of prosperity, a Europe without nationalism or racism, closed with the memorable words, therefore I say to you, let Europe arise. I'll now have the honor to introduce our two speakers. I don't need to say much because both of them are well-known political leaders. Let me start with President Poroshenko. Petro Poroshenko was born in 1965 near Odessa in Soviet Ukraine. In 1989, he received a degree in economics at the Taras Shevchenko National University in Kiev. In 2002, he published his doctoral dissertation. Outside academia, Petro Poroshenko started an impressive career, both in business and in politics. He acted as CEO of Ukrprom Invest, the Ukrainian industry and investment company, which specialized in confectionery and automotive industry. That's why he's also famously known as the chocolate king of Ukraine. <laughs> we Swiss can relate. In 2005, Mr. Poroshenko acted as Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. 2007 to 2012, he headed the National Bank Council of Ukraine. He was Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2009 and 2010, and Minister of Trade and Economic Development in 2012. Petro Poroshenko was elected President of Ukraine in, on May 25, 2014, and assumed office in June. He is the fifth elected president of Ukraine after the collapse of the Soviet Union. President Poroshenko thinks of his country as an integral part of Europe and a future member of the European Union. In Switzerland, Federal Councillor Didier Burkhalter is probably the best informed person when it comes to the current political situation in Ukraine as foreign minister and president of our country, and even more as chairman of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, he was intensively involved in finding a solution to the crisis in Ukraine in 2014. Like President Poroshenko, 
Mr. Borkhalter holds a degree in economics. He was for many years a member of the government of the city of Neuchâtel. In 2003, he was elected to the National Council. In 2007, to the Council of States. Mr. Burkhalter has been a member of the Swiss government since September 2009 and head of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs since 2012. I should also like to mention that a few days ago, the Swiss TV audience has elected Didier Burkhalter Schweizer des Jahres, Swiss Personality of the Year. I think that this... An honor that is well deserved. Most of us in Switzerland have appreciated the work he has done, um, explicitly as chairman of the OSCE, negotiating the Ukraine crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the European Institute for giving us the chance to meet two extremely interesting political personalities today. We look forward to hearing what they have to say to us. And now I kindly invite Federal Councillor Buchhalter to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, Madame, uh, Herr Rector, Herr Professor, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you for attending this conference. Thank you also for uh, having invited me to uh, make a few opening remarks tonight. I don't know if I got this honor because of uh, being elected Swiss of the Year. <laughs> but let me, uh, first of all, welcome you warmly, most warmly, Mr. President uh, Poroshenko, to my country, which is not only a country of chocolate, it's also a, a country of innovation, a country of peace, a country with eight million people eager to contribute to a world that, here, that is a more secure world for all, a country to contribute to peace. We are meeting here at a critical moment in the evolving Ukraine crisis. I should say yet another critical moment. The fact is that the outlook is not good at that moment. There is a real risk of renewed large scale military escalation in the conflict between Kiev and the illegally armed groups that have occupied certain districts in eastern Ukraine. For a country that has already undergone much suffering and turmoil in the past year, to plunge back into war would be a terrible development. It would further add to the human misery that the people in the conflict-affected areas have to endure just as it would diminish the prospect for a political solution for national reconciliation for economic recovery. I therefore call on all sides to exercise maximum restraint to pursue the political path led out in Minsk and to resolve their differences through dialogue. The future course of event in Ukraine concerns us all concerns us all, also here in Switzerland. This crisis is a tragedy primarily for the Ukrainian people. It has also thrown into question many assumptions about the post-Cold War security order in Europe. The Helsinki principles have been repeatedly violated, most blatantly when Crimea was illegally annexed by Russia, with trust between Russia and the West collapsing and polarization growing, the Ukraine crisis has evolved into one of the worst crises in the OSCE area since the end of the Cold War. Ukraine faces enormous challenges. In addition to ending the violent conflict in the East and restoring territorial integrity, these challenges include improving the country's financial situation and implementing a broad set of reforms as you, Mr. President Poroshenko, have come here to share with us your assessment of the situation and your vision for Ukraine's future, the main message I wish to convey tonight is this. Switzerland remains committed. 
Switzerland remains engaged. We will continue our engagement to help de-escalate the crisis, build bridges, promote dialogue, while our role is changing now that we no longer chair the OSC, Switzerland's resolve to contribute to a better future for Ukraine and to overcoming the broader crisis of European security remains strong. This commitment essentially, essentially comprises four aspects, diplomacy, humanitarian aid, development cooperation, and European security. First, diplomacy. Switzerland is maintaining its wide-ranging support for the effort of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSC, to defuse the Ukraine crisis. On this and on other issues, we are working closely with Serbia and with Germany in the Troika of the OSC. At the request of the Serbi Serbian chairmanship, Swiss Ambassador Heidi Taliavini is continuing his, her essential work in the trilateral contact group. While progress on advancing implementation of the Minsk agreements has been more limited and uneven uh, than we had wanted, we should not forget that such processes do take time to work. We are doing our utmost to support Ambassador Taliavini. We stay on. Switzerland also remains a strong supporter of the OSC special monitoring mission to Ukraine that was set up under our chairmanship last March. As a result of generous extra funds made available by the Swiss Parliament to strengthen Switzerland's engagement in Ukraine, Switzerland has become the fifth biggest, the fifth biggest sponsor of the special monitoring mission. There are currently 12 Swiss monitors as well on the ground uh, with the deputy chief of the mission, and we will continue to back this mission substantially. The second part of the Swiss commitment concerns the improvement of the humanitarian situation. The conflict in eastern Ukraine has claimed far too many lives already and is causing enormous suffering. More than one million, large more than one million people have been forced to flee their homes and to seek refuge elsewhere. In keeping with our humanitarian tradition, Switzerland has contributed to several large-scale multilateral aid programs. We were the sixth biggest donor of humanitarian aid in Ukraine in the past year, and we will continue to provide humanitarian aid. We are currently exploring the possibility of direct bilateral support in this regard. The tragic death, ladies and gentlemen, of the Swiss ICRC delegate in Donetsk last October has been another painful reminder of the dangers involved in helping people in need in the conflict-affected areas. Switzerland's call upon all actors involved to comply with the obligation of international law, and especially with basic humanitarian norms, including ensuring access for humanitarian actors. The third aspect of Switzerland's commitment is our long-term bilateral engagement for development cooperation in Ukraine. In March, Switzerland will launch its new cooperation strategy for Ukraine. This strategy will extend the long-standing cooperation between our two countries for another four years for the period 2015 to 2018. We have decided to double the budget for this new period to approximately $100 million. Our new cooperation strategy will, for the first time, include a peace-building component. This allows for longer-term bilateral efforts to support de-escalation and a peaceful resolution of the conflict by promoting dialogue, human rights, and international law. Dialogue on the international and national level remains key to contribute to resolve Ukraine crisis. Another focal point will be decentralization and local governance. Another obvious choice given Switzerland's own experience in such matters. Further themes include support for health care reform, for sustainable and efficient energy management, and for rendering Ukraine more business friendly. All these focal points correspond to major reform needs of Ukraine, Mr. President. Switzerland has supported Ukraine's transformation process ever since our first cooperation agreement was signed. It was in 1997. We remain committed and we will strive together with our Ukrainian colleagues for progress. 
The fourth and final aspect of Switzerland's commitment relates to the need to overcome the broader crisis in Europe, of European security. At the OSCE Ministerial Council in Basel, Switzerland, in close cooperation with our 2015 Troika partners, Serbia and Germany, launched a panel of eminent persons on European security as a common project. This panel will reflect on how to rebuild trust among the OSCE participating states and explore possibilities for reconsolidating cooperative security across the Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian regions. The composition of the panel was announced last week. There will be 15 panelists, including one from Switzerland, former Swiss member of parliament, Barbara Ehring, and one from Ukraine, former first deputy minister for foreign affairs, Alexander Chali. Switzerland will support the work of this panel throughout the year. We will also come up with our own ideas on how to overcome the crisis of European security. And one issue we are looking at concerns the nexus between trade issues and European security, building confidence, facilitating trade links between different economic zones has become an important aspect of stability in our continent. We will also continue our efforts to strengthen the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, as an anchor of cooperative security in our continent. A stronger OSCE will in itself be an important contribution to reconciliating European security as a common project. Ladies and gentlemen and dear friends, as chair of the OSCE, Switzerland was working hard to build bridges to foster dialogue and cooperation. It was an honor and it was also a responsibility. While much remains to be done, Switzerland demonstrated that it can contribute to international security in ways that are useful, that are credible for all. In the current crisis-ridden environment, we intend to further expand our activities for peace and for security, and this includes continuing our broad engagement for a democratic, stable, for a united, for a prosperous, for a peaceful Ukraine, and for enhanced security and cooperation across the whole OSCE area. Such an engagement is in our interest. It is in the interest of our countries, of our continent, of our world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Federal Councillor. Now, dear Mr. President, please do us the honor of addressing us. We are looking forward to your words. Dear Mr. Rector, dear Mr. Federal Chancellor, all the professors, all Ukrainians who come here to support me and to support Ukraine. This is very important for me and for my country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Truly, I am very honored to speak at this truly historic place. These walls have witnessed so many landmark events and so many prominent figures have expressed their idea bound to change the world for better. It was here at this university shortly after World War II when the European continent was still lying in ruins when Sir Winston Churchill called for the creation of the United Europe. His urge then was, we must build a kind of United States of Europe. In this way only will hundreds of millions of toilets, toilers be able to regain a simple joys and simple hopes which make life worth living. I am convicted that life worth living is evident when I look into the eyes of my children. This should be eyes without fear. And that's possible only when we have a freedom and democracy. Mr. President, 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's applause this gentleman that he leave in our audience. Bye, gentlemen. Bravo. Look, frankly speaking, I think this is a very symbolic. This is the picture of the whole world. And the whole world is united. And the whole world is demonstrating the solidarity with Ukraine. And those, and those who support the aggressor, he is in a complete isolation. Nobody in the world will support them. This happens in United Nations General Assembly Conference, this happened in the United Nations Security Council. This happens in the G20 meeting in Brisbane. This happened in Europe. This happened in the world. And that gives me a very strong hope that the perspective of the world is absolutely bright. That the values which united us is a freedom and democracy. And I'm absolutely sure and we, when we were united, the victory would be with us, no doubt. <laughs> Why? Why it's happened? Why the uh, words of Churchill is come to the real life? Because we have a very great evidence. The 28 nations 28 European nations, members of the European Union, demonstrate a success story. Success story for 500 million people when everybody respects the freedom, everybody respects the sovereignty, everybody respects the territorial integrity, everybody respects the democracy. And at the same time, they demonstrate and advance with the highest level, not only with the political freedom, but with a very high level of the economic standard. In the wake of the cruelest war in the human history, Churchill's dream of the united Europe sound a little bit idealistic and a little bit naive. Now, in the 21st century, Churchill's dream is not anymore. Churchill's idealism has morphed into reality. But after almost 70 years of the flourishing European project, the new global challenges have appeared calling on the European leaders to seek further way to ensure growth and security as well as the unavailability of the democratic liberties. Europe needs now a new impulse. The whole of Europe is again under attack. I repeat, not only Ukraine. Under attack now is the whole Europe and the whole civilized world. And Ukraine now simply on the fried line of this battle. The contingent ideas of the liberty and democracy are being directly challenged. The European Union, unlike Switzerland, cannot rely on its geographical endowments and on its unique security model. I told about that, Didier Bugalter. But it should look beyond its current borders to enhance its security. Today, the threat faced by Europe are similar to those that are now struggled against in Ukraine. My country waged a war against a terrorism. It fights in the forefront of the European values such as freedom, sovereignty and democracy. And Ukraine should become a full-fledged member of the European family of nations. I have no doubt of that. We, it should happen while already being its indivisible historic, spiritual and intellectual part, already being a God 
and if you allow me, already being a new symbol of the free Europe. The concept of the sovereignty brought to us by the peace of Westphalia back in 1648 put in an end to one of the most devastating and lengthy war in Europe. I don't want to sit with someone in this room who is killing children. Thank you very much indeed. And in my speech, and in my speech, I said something about killing children. I have here, I have, that's, <laughs> if anybody understand what she said, this is exactly the cultural level of this lady. That's thank you. Slava Ukraini. <laughs> That's very difficult to say about the killing children. This is the sign which means Je suis Volonavaha. Volonavaha. It's a tiny town on the east part of Ukraine when the 13 of January, a Russian missile fly from the occupied Dokuchevsk hit the civilian bus where was altogether uh, altogether 29 persons, including one children, children. 13 of this person were killed in one moment, absolutely innocent civilian victim was killed by terrorists supporting by Russia, supply Russian uh, weapons and give an order from Russian side. That's something about children. And that's why the whole civilized world concentrate their efforts to stop the war. And everybody could do whatever they can to stop the war. In this sense, I want to thank Didier Bugalter when we together, when he was the president of Switzerland and the president of the OEC, and from the very first moment after my inauguration speech, I declare the ceasefire and the process of peace negotiation. And we receive a strong support in form of the creation of the special monitoring mission of the OEC. And we were absolutely open to demonstrate that Ukrainian people want nothing by peace. And Ukrainian leaders want simply nothing by peace. And this is a foreign troops to come to Crimea and make an annex. And this is a thousands and thousands of foreign troops come to some part of the Donetsk and Lugansk region, killing the innocent civilians, attacking and supporting the terrorists. And I think this is a very important thing. And, and And this is a very important, to have a, right, to have a right to speak in the presence of the Ukrainian president. <laughs> in Russia, you don't have ever these rights. <laughs> it's, 
in, and in Switzerland and in Ukraine, they have a right to speak whatever they want. That's why we are stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, one may ask why Ukraine, as a member, would be more beneficial to the EU, reliable and predictable. Not even being an EU citizen, the Ukrainians stood up against the bullet in defense of the core European values. What started as a student movement quickly involved all the Ukraine delegation, uh, generation who stood up defending their children. The faces of those who died in their country still line the streets of the downtown of Kiev. Their picture proves that they hailed from every generation, every social class, every region of Ukraine. We Ukrainians call them Heavenly Hundred. And they died defending not only their country, but also the values on which Europe is built. Freedom, dignity, rule of law. They go on the street of the Kiev exactly one year ago, on the 19th of February, the first massive demonstration, understanding that from the, those side there is a riot police who has a bullet, who has a riot, and who can kill every of them. They go there to defend the future of their country. And that's why we now have a very high level of the responsibility to demonstrate that their, their heroism was very important for us. Ukraine has proven its democratic commitment should not be kept in the sidelines of Europe. Inefficiency and innovation-led sustainable economies, it is not longer about the production factor, steel, coal or gas, but about the people with the potential, skill and vision alike. And Didier, I also want to build up in Ukraine, which would be not only famous with its chocolate, but, <laughs> but, but with their freedom, with their intellectual uh, possibilities, with their business climate and everything. And I think that in exchange of the experience, we together can reach them. This goes beyond the wider common market opportunities. It is also about the single space based on the common values and consolidated community capable to efficiently interact to address the current challenges. Tolerance, empathy, support demonstrated by the Ukrainian people sometimes speaking different languages and even practices different religion can serve a good example for Europe in face of its current challenges. Hundreds, thousands displayed Person, displaced person who fled from the Russian-occupied Crimea and war-torn regions of Donbass have found a hospitable shelter and support in central and western part of Ukraine. They believe in Ukraine. They believe in their country. And Ukrainian men do not escape the country but go to Donbass and fight to win the peace. A modern and capable Ukrainian army has emerged in a year of war. Ukrainian soldiers demonstrate impressive combat spirit, professional skills and legendary heroism. In the international Donetsk airport, our soldiers withstood a siege of eight months earning fame as kiborgs. Alongside the soldiers serve hundreds of brave volunteers and under the hail of shells, and gunfire procure our army, deliver medical and humanitarian help. Ch <clears throat> Churchill called for Europe to arise, set a peace and prosperity in these walls in the 19th of September 1946. It was also on the 19th of September last year when we have finalized Minsk agreement to seize a bloodshed in Donbas and to launch the peace process on my peace plan. Ladies and gentlemen, my peace plan is very simple. Point number one, please stop shelling, stop fire, make a ceasefire, complete ceasefire. This is absolutely necessary. 
Point number two, please, immediately release all the hostages which you illegally kept in the prisons. And this citizen is my citizen. Significant part of this citizen is in a Russian prison. It was just captured, delivered, and illegally kept there. Point number three, please, close the border. Close the border with Russia. Point number four, please withdraw all of your troops. And we are ready for immediate political dialogue. Because the only possible way in the democratic society how to keep the peace is very simple. The election. And we should make a free and fair election in Donbass. And me as a president of Ukraine are ready to have a dialogue with anybody who would be elected by the people of Donbass, not by to come with a machine gun to Donbass people and killing them. Can anybody be against this plan? It seems to me no. But yes, because from the 19th of September, it's already four months come. And even when they publicly start to support the peace plan, no one single step was done from Russia, unfortunately, and from terrorists. Instead of that, they arranged the illegal farce on the 2nd of November without any international observers, without rules, without the law. And I ask a very absolutely sing a simple question. Is it Ukrainian territory? Everybody said yes, including Russia. Okay. Is it Ukrainian citizen who living there? They said yes. Okay. And in that situation, under which legislation we should have an election? Russian? Ossetian? Transnistrian? Anything else? For the civilized person, there is simply not exist any other, action, any other answer. And that's why the peace plan is world accepted, worldwide accepted, and worldwide recognized. And that's why we insist that this very simple point especially if they put a signature after this plan, should be fulfilled. And just to deliver them the message that this is a, not a buffer breakfast in the hotel restaurant, then you can take one point of these 12 points and reject it from others. No, you should fulfill everything, because this is the only way how to de-escalate the situation on the East. And why I propose this peace plan? Because during my election campaign, and immediately after that, I was demonstrated that I am a president of peace, not president of war. And with Minsk arrangement, I immediately declare what I promised, the ceasefire. And under this ceasefire, Ukrainian troops are standing without a right to open the fire, and the terrorists killing my soldiers. And it happened for 10 days. Then when we can declare the next ceasefire on the 5th of September, can you imagine that from this date, from the 5th of September, already 232 Ukrainian soldiers were killed. We do not reach any additional territory. They entering for some piece of our land and trying to make a picture. No, 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 no. This is the, some conflict. Sometimes Ukrainian side violating that, some, some, sometimes terrorists violating. No. Ukraine is a responsible partner for the peace process. And I think that we demonstrate it now, we demonstrate it in the past, and we will demonstrate it in the future. And I laid the hopes that the other side will adhere to their commitments and we will restore the peace. The OEC and other international partners can confirm that Ukraine upholds the Minsk agreement. At the same time, OEC confirm that the other side does not. The constant violation of the ceasefire regime uh, also killed not only the civilian, several hundred, not only the soldiers, several hundred innocent civilians was the victims of this violation. 
Despite the truth, the Russian equipped, trained, and the supply rebels continue to wage the war against the Ukrainian armed forces, shelling the residential area and killing civilians. Each day of the, the past year has been trauma for the Ukrainian people. I want to demonstrate you just very few examples. On the June the 8th, militants of the so-called Donetsk People Republic tortured and killed eight priests of the Protestant Church and filmed it on the video. It happened in Ukrainian city of Slovensk. On the July 17, the Russian missile brought down the Malaysian MH17 plane in the sky over Donbass, killing 298 innocent people and from 17 countries. And that demonstrates that terror is not only danger for one country, it's the danger for the whole world. And again, on the January 13, the terrorist fire at a passenger bus of Volonovaha, killing 13 and wounded 15 Ukrainian civilians. MH17 and Volonovaha bus passenger, Ukrainian priest of the Protestant Church from Slovensk, and Charlie Abdo, parish kosher store victim of religious fanatics. They all come from different countries but have fallen in one war of terror. Terrorism knows no, no border. The world has to react to these atrocities jointly and decisively. And I am proud to be with the leaders in one line, with the leaders of more than 50 countries on the street of Paris with the sign, Je suis Charlie, Demonstrate. And there, there was some other sign. We are not afraid. That was the main messages for the people in Paris, and that is the main messages for the people in the world. We are not afraid, the terrorists, because we are united and we are strong. And again, Mr. Federal Chancellor, the OEC chairman in office, you made a significant contribution to facilitating the peaceful settlement. And again, all Ukrainian people appreciate these efforts. Yet, I believe that the democratic world must further consolidate and joint and resolute response to the aggression on my country and violation of the international law by Russia. The efficiency of this response will, in fact, affect the future path of Ukraine. I believe, and it is internationally acknowledged, that the only way to de-escalate the conflict is to implement Minsk agreement in their ent entirety and in the good faith. If there is no resolution, Ukraine will have to continue paying a too high price of human lives, enormous spending of defense rather than on reforms. Basically, this is exactly what aggressor aspire to, to stop reform, to froze the conflict, to prevent Ukraine from transport, transforming into the modern European democratic state. Dear ladies and gentlemen, nevertheless, realizing the need of the comprehensive transformation, Ukraine has embarked series of the reform. Can you imagine that in this condition, when every single day Ukraine spent 100 million grivna on the defense expenditure to keep security on the east. Our top priority is the reform. The, our vision for the next five years is summarized in the strategy of the sustainable development of 2020. It is a roadmap for reforms in response to demands of the Ukrainian people expressed on Maidan Square in Kyiv and throughout the country. Moreover, this reform are the only path for Ukraine not only to develop but also to survive. Why 2020? Because we aspire to reach the European standards by this time and apply for the membership for Ukraine in the European Union. I think 
six years is more than enough for us and will be adequate to the Maastricht, Copenhagen and other criteria to ask for the membership. I'm absolutely sure that we will have a success. And I'm absolutely sure that at this level of support of Ukraine among the European member states, and which is very important among the European people, we will gain this membership perspective. And I believe that the Ukrainian people deserve to be a part of the Churchill vision of glorious and united Europe. And so I gave this solemn promise of the complete transformation of my country, both to the Ukrainian people and to our partners in the European Union. I believe that we have means to achieve our aspiration. The current Ukrainian government are first in our history to have such a determined outlook and have already taken the step to reach them. I was several times in Ukrainian governments. Can you imagine that I was the only person who speaks English? <laughs> Can you imagine that now? <laughs> Can you imagine that now that only one minister not speaks English? He is very ashamed and he starts to learn English immediately. <laughs> First, Ukraine will be democratic and free, and it will be effectively and fully exercise its sovereignty within the internationally recognized border. We are determined to accomplish a total of 62 reforms in five years, and we plan to achieve ranking by top 30 in the World Bank rating of doing business and top 50 under the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. And we aim to significantly increase our GDP per capita, net foreign direct investment, inflow, and strengthen the national security and defense sector. We plan to increase life expectancy by three years in Ukraine. And my purpose is that the 75% of the school graduates will have mastered the two, at least two foreign languages. It seems to me the same like in Switzerland. And it is ambitious plan, but also attainable. We have already begun reforming public institution by shrinking their number, but improving their efficiency. Currently, Ukraine among the countries subject to the largest amount of the lawsuit within the European Court of Human Rights. Thus, we aspire to enhance the rules of law, rule of law, ensure the efficiency of the Ukrainian judiciary, and rebuild trust in the Ukrainian legal system. This was one of the key demands of our revolution. This is also a goal for the law enforcement. We have initiated a reform of law enforcement agency, increase citizen trust in the institution, and to believe that they can seek the justice. As a good example, I invite a very nice lady with a very good experience who was the first deputy of the Georgian Minister of Interior and she would be responsible for the reform in the, our Minister of Interior. I give her the Ukrainian citizenship and she, who lives at that time several years in France, receive Ukrainian citizenship and work hard for reform my country. I really like these enthusiastic people, and I am really absolutely sure that we will win this battle against corruption. Uh, without eradicating deeply rooted corruption from our state and society, all other efforts would be in vain. The first anti-corruption package is already being implemented. We established the National Anti-Corruption Bureau as the first step toward the ensuring transparent and responsible activity within the public center. Government strongly support and improving condition for the doing business in Ukraine. We are cutting the number of inspection and required licenses. We are changing the tax system and deregulating to improve the business climate. Ukraine is bound to develop into the dynamic, competitive, innovative, export-oriented economy fully integrated in the European Union. The deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union pushes us to accelerate the legislative and regulatory harmonization. This has been many opinion on likely advantages and disadvantages of the DCFTA. I will say frankly, we will be challenging. However, it is a choice for the future. It means trust and civilized rules of doing business. 
deep and comprehensive free trade agreement means a better investment climate. It is about coming into one of the largest markets of the world and reaching out the third countries. Ukraine will do its best to capitalize both old and new markets, and we will try to strengthen our presence in Europe and support business going elsewhere. We will enhance our energy security and independence. To this end, we will continue working towards the full implementation of the third energy package of the Energy Community Treaty with the European Union to establish a reliable and cost-effective energy market, modernizing our energy sector and seeking innovative solutions for the diversification of energy supply sources and routes. First steps have been already done. We have established solid reverse gas flows from other countries to Ukraine, and I would like to express my gratitude to our partners for their solidarity. And we invited investors from US and EU to participate in the modernization of the Ukrainian gas transportation system, and we are working on improving the attractiveness of the energy sector investment. Ukraine can be largely contribute as an additional element for the European energy security with the transit infrastructure and unique underground gas storage for the 31 billion cubic meters. We have approved plan to reduce national gas consumption by 2017 through the improved energy efficiency. Can you imagine that the, uh, seven, six years ago, my country supplied 70 billion cubic meters of gas, and today only 40. This is a real, real, and ma ma much, most of this, much of this achievement was done this year. And I'm absolutely sure that within two years, we simply don't need Russian gas. This is a very important factor of the energy independence. <laughs> Ukraine also strives to the implement modern standards of the environmental protection. I strongly believe that the quality of life depends on the ecological security. Ukraine was also have been as a breadbasket of Europe, as our country offers large untapped potential for the green and organic products. I intend to open Ukraine to the world, and we will fully integrate the global scientific, education, cultural space, and develop respective people-to-people -people contact. A visa-free regime with the EU is one of the Ukraine's top priority in 2015, and I expect that the Riga uh, summit of the Eastern Partnership, we will make this decision. We, we have a last obstacle as a biometric passport. And one week ago, it was me, as a president of Ukraine, who received first Ukrainian biometric passport with the, with the number 00001. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think this is a very symbolic, that we, uh, we are ready to have a visa-free regime with the European Union. And that will become a real milestone for the visa liberalization track. Distinguished audience, in 10 or 20 years from now, does Europe see itself strong enough to address of growing challenges? In the coming decades, does it also feel being fully ready to counterweight in growth and productivity the other global powers? Wouldn't it be stronger with Ukrainian human in economic potential? It should be clear that Ukraine's national graviation towards the European Union is not targeted against Russia. Absolutely not. Frankly speaking, I was absolutely interested in that Russia should be part of Europe. And that creates absolutely a new system of the security. And that may be a void for us the necessity to listen to this two or three person in this hall and they try to defend the right of Russia to be in an absolutely old-style system. I think this is absolutely not in the interest of the Russian people itself. In this discourse, for the centuries, Ukraine was preferred to stay in the gray or rather buffer zone to maintain a fragile post-Cold War balance. I may give you a bit of shock by assuming that one day Ukraine is no longer a part of the buffer zone but full-fledged of the European Union member, will push Russia to undergo the democratic and structural economic changes and gravitate towards Western world. 
While kept in a buffer zone, Ukraine appears to provoke Russia to maintain its internal political status quo and confront with the European values. We must give the impetus of such transformation in Russia by admitting Ukraine to the European family of nations, even if Russia does not become a European member this eventual process will trigger a wider democratization to Belarus, promote security in Moldova and Georgia and beyond. I wish we could still benefit from the Sir Winston Churchill's wisdom to predict for the decades and to engage all the countries, discard all grievances, hatred and revenges for the better future of the people to seek happiness, prosperity and glory for Europe. Russia's hybrid war poses a direct threat, direct threat to the European community built on the common values. The initiator of this conflict cynically believed that Europe cannot and will not act as one refusing to stand up for its value in the face of the direct challenges. Can you imagine that exactly one year ago, when I have a floor on the Munich Security Conference, and I have a meeting with the most of the uh, ministers of the foreign affairs of the European Union and I ask, can Europe be united to defend Ukraine? 50% said no, we cannot believe in that. 28 nations, it's very hard to find out a compromise. And that's what skeptics of European Union expect from the behavior of the European Union. But we break the stereotypes. We demonstrate that the common values is, can unite European Union. And I am proud to this behavior, to this fact, which European Union demonstrate this year. But like many before, uh, me have a dream. And I have a conviction that if Europe stands together with Ukraine, Europe is invincible that no matter how many difficulties might be lie ahead, if Europe stands together with Ukraine on defense, freedom, dignity, democracy, and life without fear, then the future of Europe will be much more safe and much more bright. After the shocking week of the tragic events in France and the terrifying terrorist strike against the bus with the civilians near Volonavakh, all Europe must unite around two simple ideas. Only together, the democratic nation can stand up for the freedom of present and future generation of humankind to life without fear, without threat of terrorism, build a brighter future. Values are not for the sale, and we must do what it takes to defend them, the values. Slava Ukraini! And thank you very much, all of you. Pane Presidente, Monsieur le Conseiller Fédéral, <laughs> Ladies and Gentlemen, <laughs> before opening the question and answer session, which I am chairing on behalf of the Europa Institute of the University of Zurich, I would like to thank the President for his very inspiring encouraging and enlightening speech and I would also like you I would like to thank you Mr. President for your readiness to take some questions and I would ask you to raise questions there are a couple of microphones around and I would ask you kindly to present yourself and to be very brief so that we can take quite a few questions which is the first one? Here, please. Hello. Dobrý večer, pane prezidente. Sláva Ukrajine. Evening, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Evgeny Pratsuk. I'm a programmer here. Um, so we all believe that 
Ukraine expects a great future, and, uh, but the challenges we face in are enormous, and the risks are high. And um, one of the points I see here is the lack of reforms. So I want to ask you, as not as a president, not as a politician, but as a man of act, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, how do you evaluate the, the, the tempo of the re reforms uh, nowadays in Ukraine? Um, what can be done to speed it up? And what you personally will do to speed it up? Thanks. What is the reform? In our understanding, this is not simply fighting against corruption. This is very easy understanding. But this is the fa fighting against an effective bureaucracy, unexperienced, which is left from the Soviet time. And we need to establish absolutely new uh, number of persons who will work in Ukrainian institution, maybe with a Western education. We are waiting for you back to Ukraine. <laughs> And I, think, and I think together we can win this battle. We have no excuse to lose it. Please. The next question, please. Dear Mr. President, my name is Dmitry Lituyev. I'm a researcher at this university, born in Donetsk. In your uh, talk... Um, this is very important that the more people from the Donetsk will have, uh, will be a researcher or will have a Western education, the more people, and I have no doubt that we will win this battle and you will have an opportunity to come back to Donetsk Oops. with the Western values, this make, make us easier to win this battle, not on the ground, but for the brain. And today I have a meeting before fly, my flight to Zurich with the Polish Prime Minister Eva Kopacz, and we agreed that we establish the new uh, 500 wage uh, stipendia, uh, scholarship. scholarship, a new 500 scholarship, 200 for the children of our uh, soldiers and 300 for the people from Donetsk. Because this is very important and they have an opportunity to go to Zurich, to Warsaw, to India, and absolutely necessary come back that give us new opportunity to bring the new values, new democracy, new freedom to Donetsk. That's why I'm very happy that you are from Donetsk, have a research of Thank Syria. you very much. So in your talk you mentioned, again, you reiterate about the importance of education. You mentioned the generous support, diplomatic and other support of Switzerland, which we all appreciate, and the problem of judicial system. My question concerns all of these issues in some sense. So I'd like to ask is about what is being done to return the assets of Yunikovic, his family and associates, which are frozen here in Switzerland on uh, the accounts. Because uh, almost a year ago, the members of Ukrainian diaspora came to the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, to hand a petition addressed to the Mr. Uh, Federal President Didier Burkhalter. Uh, to f and among other questions, there was, we asked to freeze the assets of the uh, people who are responsible for human rights violations in Ukraine. And thank you very much. Uh, the Swiss governance did it. They froze the assets on the next or after the next day. So the question is how Ukraine can, can use this opportunity to fill the budget and maybe to help also the researchers who are now are suffering severe cuts of the budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, First of all, I want to again uh, uh, thank the Swiss government uh, and personally Didier Bugalter for the uh, cooperation with our investigation agency and for help us to frozen these uh, assets of the uh, former dictator. Second, I want to thank the, to the diaspora who helped us to, to make this search. And the third, uh, under previous Ukrainian legislation, we have, if the person who is accused are not in Ukraine and we cannot present it him in, front, uh, in the court, we have no possibility to make a court process. Just five days ago, our new parliament to make a new law which allow us 
even if without presence in the court, but if we have full evidence and if investigation is finished, to present it in the court, the case, and to, be, to have the court decision. Immediately when we have a court decision, we can ask Switzerland to return and for the legal cooperation in returning this money to Ukraine. Uh, as far as G Prosecutor General Office and Minister of Interior inform me, they would be ready at the beginning of February uh, to transfer this case to the court. And I think we should not wait too, too long for the normal, normal, open and democratic court procedure with a possibility all the journalists, all the interesting person sitting there and understanding that this is completely not a political process. This is the uh, absolutely legal, free, fair process where uh, the Ukraine and the whole world will uh, demonstrate the crimes of the previous dictator. Thank you. Dear Mr. President, um, yes, um, I'm different. I'm a Swiss guy. I'm born in Switzerland. <laughs> And I want to um, give you an impression I have from Ukraine. I was traveling very lot of time to Ukraine. I've seen Ukraine. It's a beautiful, wonderful country. Thank you. I'm used to Swiss economic, and I see Ukrainian economic. You're a very strong country. You have integer people, and it's a very beautiful country with a lot, with a, with a lot of potential. I was thinking a lot of time, how many time do you need to go into European Union? What are the criteria that are not yet filled up? Why not? Ukraine is a very powerful country. You have good economics. You have good... Um, good um, food uh, economics, uh, you have a lot of systems they are working and running on. So why Ukraine cannot go to European Union? What is missing there? We need two uh, main factors. First factor, Ukraine should be ready for entering the European Union. And for that purpose, we should reform the country. There is some, a, a certain criteria, as I mentioned. Copenhagen criteria, Maastricht criteria, criteria of GDP per capita, criteria of uh, harmonization of the legislation. This is the long, long work, and we launch it when? This year, uh, last year, year 2014. When me, immediately after I was elected as a president of Ukraine, it was in May, I come into position in June, and in the June, uh, 27 in Brussels, I signed up association agreement with the European Union. What is the association agreement? This is not just a cloud. This is detailized program of the harmonization of the country to prepare, prepare in the process of preparation for uh, being a member. And the, my program and my strategy of the reform is very well calculated. And I told you that we need a six years why? Because 23 years before, we do nothing. We do not reform the country. We have a vast corruption. We have an absolutely ineffective bureaucracy. But we have a one main advantage. We have a brilliant, very talented, very heroic, very patriotic people of Ukraine. And that gives me absolutely, abso I'm absolutely sure that we will win this battle and we will be the member. And there is a second factor. The second factor is the readiness of the European Union to have Ukraine as a member. Beforehand, it was, uh, m m most of the European countries was not ready for that. And only now, when Ukrainian people, during the revolution of dignity and after that, pass maybe one of the most difficult uh, tests in their life and in their history. Test for being European. Test for, be, for, the, uh, for being free, to, for being democratic. Ukrainian people make two very important revolution. revolution revol Orange Revolution in 2004 and Revolution of Dignity. I promise you. We do not have third revolution. We will be a member of the European Union. Thank you. One last question, please. Uh, I'm Peter Kratz. I'm chairman of a genuinely Ukrainian company in the Dnieper Petrovsk region. Um, 
we employed 2,500 people, and we are having problems. Uh, we pay on our loans, euro dollar loans, 10% and more. Our competitors, 2 to 3% because of the country risk. The devaluation benefit has largely disappeared because Russia has done the same thing, and also the euro has weakened significantly. And even, we are a big exporter, even the VAT refund doesn't arrive. Mr. President, it's difficult to be successful in such, such an environment. The industry, those who give jobs to the people, we need your support, we need your action, and we please need it fast. Thank you. Slava Ukraina. I fully share your view, and I come to the politics from the business community. And I understand how difficult for the company now in that situation work in this market. Uh, I'm pretending that corruption is lower, and that's true, and what we have done for the short period of time. But again, imagine everything we done for reforms now it is extremely unpopular because anybody think that reforms means lowering the taxes and rising the salaries this is not true this is cutting the budget deficit make economy more competitive cutting the unnecessary bureaucrats from the huge and ineffective uh, bureaucratic apparatus, unfortunately cutting the social benefits left, uh, uh, which was left from the time of Soviet Union. But we do that. And at the same time, why I tell you that I so, uh, love, uh, so much love Ukrainian people, that during the war, during the enormous pressure we have now on the Ukrainian people. We cutting all these things and Ukrainian people support us. Just on the last parliamentary election, everybody told me, please don't do the parliamentary election, don't declare the early parliamentary election, because this is simply very dangerous during the war. I said no, because I have almost 50% of the parliament is the Russian fifth column. And I trust to the Ukrainian people. And can you imagine that Ukrainian people vote for more than 300 members of parliament, more than constitutional majority, or the political forces for the, with the European orientation, which give us a mandate, people give us a mandate, please lead our country to the European Union. During this year, we have a tremendous changes in the opinion of Ukrainian people. Can you imagine that one year ago only 32% of Ukrainians were for European Union? Today is more than 75. Can you imagine that two or three years ago only 16% of Ukrainians were for NATO? Today is almost 60. 16 and 60. And that is the changes which bring to our country, do you know who? Putin. <laughs> he helped us to be stronger. He helped us to be more pro-European. He helped us to be more responsible for the security and defense and for the future of our country. I really believe in our success together with you. Please, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for having answered all these questions in this very frank and sincere manner. And I would also thank you once again for being, having been with us, that you stop on your trip to Davos here in Zurich. We are all very grateful to you, and uh, we wish you in your very challenging and difficult task all the success for you and your country. 
Before we let you go, we have a little present, three gifts for you. The first gift is the Swiss Army knife. <laughs> This is the first non-lethal weapons we receive from Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> the second one has to do with your former career as a chocolate king. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> as you are no more a chocolate producer, it might be more easy for you to enjoy chocolate from your competitor. <laughs> from your former competitor. Thank you. And then we have a book which summarizes all the speeches and we would be very happy if next year we could have a document which, with your speech in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I, hope, I hope that the two first gifts are valuable for you and let me say uh, they have become even more valuable, measured in euro, since last Thursday. <laughs> That's true. Thank you very much. <laughs> Over there.